In this chapter, we will be discussing water and what makes it so unique. Water is unlike any other compound. If it weren't for water, we would not exist. Water is extremely light. It's only 18 grams per mole. Remember, a mole is the quantity of atoms. So in 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water, it only weighs 18 grams. Yet, it's a liquid at room temperature. If we compare this to carbon dioxide, that's approximately 44. So this is actually heavier, yet it's a gas at room temperature. It expands when it freezes rather than contracts, which is why ice floats. If it didn't expand, if it didn't float, our ecosystem would not exist. It's an anomaly. anomaly. But why does it behave like this? You may remember from chapter 3 that water it consists of three atoms. It has one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Now if we look at the periodic table, hydrogen is here, so it has one valence electron. Oxygen is here, it has six valence electrons, which is why it has one dot, and then oxygen has these other six. You may also remember about how things bond together. Two of these electrons form bonds. The other four are unpaired electrons that just take up space. So instead of it being straight across, these two electrons are pushing those hydrogen bonds down, which is giving it a bent structure. The previous slide was all a review from previous chapters. Electronegativity is, a, is new for us and also explains many of the properties of water. Electronegativity is how much an atom wants another electron. So when two things are bonded together like oxygen or hydrogen, oxygen, because it's a higher number here, is more electronegative. So the electrons are drifting towards them. They're still sharing a, the two electrons, just not evenly. So, oxygen wants the electron more than the hydrogen does. Therefore, the electrons drift from the hydrogen to the oxygen. This creates what's called a polar bond. A polar bond... A polar bond is a bond that is a covalent bond in which the electrons are not shared evenly, but rather displaced towards the more electronegative atom. This is creating a situation where the electrons are shifting from the hydrogen towards the oxygen. It's creating a situation where the oxygen is slightly negative. This sign here means partial. So partially negative. So it's not a completely negative charge, it's just a little bit negative. As a result, the polar bonds, the, as a result of the polar bonds, the entire molecule is polar. A polar molecule is between a nonpolar covalent bond and an ionic bond. So if we look at this as a continuum, here's an ionic bond. This is where there's a completely negative and a completely ne positive, like salt, where the electron from the sodium gave it up to the chlorine. So that's completely positive and this is completely negative. This is nonpolar. So that would be like this here. Hydrogen, hydrogen, since it's the same atom, it has the exact same electronegativity. As a result, the electrons are not shifting from one to the other, so they're shared evenly. 
all the rest of this is poor. That means the electrons are being shared, but they're not being shared evenly. So as a result of this polar bond, this is making this partially positive and this area partially negative. That means that in every single compound, you're going to have the exact same arrangement. So this is positive and this is negative. Opposite charges attract to each other. So this positive and this negative are attracted to one another. And that's called a hydrogen bond. This is not referred to an actual hydrogen-oxygen bond in the molecule, but an attraction between the molecules. A hydrogen bond is an electrostatic attraction, meaning the positive and the negative, between, the, between an atom bearing a positive charge and one molecule and an atom of a negative charge with the neighboring molecule. The hydrogen atom must be actually bonded, so here's the hydrogen, it must be actually bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Hydrogen bonds typically are only about one fifteenth as strong as a covalent bond that connects atoms together within the molecules. So these are not true bonds here. These are attractions. And we're going to see hydrogen bonds come up over and over again. So you do want to be somewhat familiar with it. The partially negative bond charge from the oxygen is attracted to the partially positive charge from the hydrogen. So here's the hydrogen again, and here's the oxygen. It's being attracted. This attraction makes the molecule want to, to be close to one another. This is what's giving water such a high boiling point. Water has an extremely high capacity, heat capacity, which means it can absorb a lot of heat. Because these want to be close to each other, they don't want to separate. So what it means by the boiling point is that in order for the to boil, these have to this attraction has to go away. It doesn't want to go away because they want to be close to each other. So it takes a lot of energy to pull those apart. It also makes the molecule spread out as a solid, which is giving it the lower density and why it floats. So let's move on to some, more, some of the more physical properties of water. You may have seen the word potable or non-potable describing water. It means whether or not you can drink it. So potable water means that it's drinkable, where non-potable it means you can't. We discussed earlier about the carbon footprint. Well, this is similar to it. The water footprint is the amount of water necessary to sustain a, the consumption of goods and, and services. Notice that once again, America uses the most. Each American uses approximately 2,500 liters, approximately 640 gallons of water a year. Notice that in each of the countries represented, agriculture is also the highest consumer of the water. So in Thailand, huge amount of ag is used to, for water. But in every single one of, this, one of these, the agriculture is always the biggest consumer of it. We depend on water to grow crops and raise farm animals. So we need... 15,000 liters of water for one kilogram of beef. We need 900 liters of water for one kilogram of corn. Notice how much water basic products take. It may seem like a, it may seem like may not seem like it, but for every orange you eat, we need 50 liters of water to grow it. For a cotton shirt, 
we need 2,700 liters of water, which is about 692 gallons. For the cultivating of the plant and then processing of the cotton. These numbers are just estimates and they are somewhat controversial because it is so hard to determine. It is mainly just to give you a general idea. Although the Although the planet is 78% of the Earth's surface is water, clean, potable water, water that you can actually drink, fit for consumption, is actually really rare. Of all the water in the world, 68% of it is in ice caps. And we can't even get to them. And glaciers. 30% of our fresh water is underground. And we have to drill for it. Less than 1% of the water in the atmosphere, and only 0.3%. Of the fresh water is lakes, swamps, and rivers, which is the easiest to get to. What happens if you do not have water nearby or, you, or that you can drill? Some people have to rely on trucks to come and deliver water. Others have to walk and gather water and bring it back to their community. Just like the earth has a carbon cycle, we also have a water cycle. Notice that there is a definite pattern where the evaporation of the oceans brings the water into the atmosphere. Which then precipitates onto the mountains and cause runoff to the precipitation of, in the form of precipitation, into rivers, lakes, and the underground. Most of the central United States get their water from the o Ogala aquifers, which contains trapped water from the previous ice age. In the Midwest, we get our waters from the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, the water that we are using does not get replenished as fast as we are using it. The average American uses 100 gallons of water a day. Three quarters of this goes down the drain and wasted, from brushing your teeth, taking showers, things along those lines. The average, uh, we are also harming the water in other ways too. We're adding pollutants to the groundwater and by using fertilizers and landfills that chemicals can to the chemicals in the ground fertilizers landfills chemicals that's all poisoning our water this map indicates where there are issues with drinking water you'll notice that the dark green areas do not typically have a problem so this is us here in Europe and Asia or in Russia. The other areas such as Africa and South America and Asia actually have a fairly large issue. In the next section we're going to start discussing the pollutants in the water.